Hello and welcome to our From the Top series, where we talk to leaders in the aerospace and defence industry about their businesses, their dreams and their worries. Today we welcome to the programme Melanie Strickland, who is the co-founder and CEO of US company Slingshot Aerospace, a company building decision intelligence technologies to ensure space remains a safe and secure gateway of discovery and continues to be a core tenet of our global economy for generations to come. Now, if like me, you associate Slingshot with the ancient story of David and Goliath, you'll not be surprised to hear that Slingshot was just a minnow startup in 2017. But just four years later, it's bringing its expertise to assist organizations like the US military, Boeing and NASA. Now, Melanie is a co-founder of the company, which she formed after retiring from the Air Force after 21 years of service. It's an emerging space technology company, revolutionizing data exploitation for defense and commercial applications. And Melanie has been recognized as one of America's top 100 female founders. It's a marvelous story, and we're delighted to have her with us now. Melanie, welcome to the program. Great. Now, I think to understand Slingshot Aerospace and the change it's bringing about the way we view data from space, I think it's important to first understand you, where you've come from, and how you began this love affair with space. Thank you. So my love affair with space started when I was a little girl. I grew up in West Texas, um, and the night skies there were just pristine. So looking up at the night sky, often seeing the, the Milky Way there was such an inspiration to me. Um, and once I learned about the, the space program, the U.S. space program, I marched my little girl self down to the library and uh, found all of the different NASA agencies' addresses and wrote every one of them. And soon after, I started receiving material, to my surprise, uh, from each of the, the different uh, NASA agencies here in the U.S. And I took those pictures and diagrams and stapled them to my wall where they remained for years to come. And that's where it all started. I was hooked and, uh, and, I, and I later joined the Air Force to, to take that dream to a different level and uh, spent 21 years doing that. So 21 years in the Air Force, I suspect being a woman in the Air Force was a bit of a challenge 21 years ago. And here we are again today, you're heading a successful aerospace business as CEO, where it's probably even rarer to have a woman in that role. How are you finding that? Yes, it's working for me. Um, we've got a diverse team of experts here at Slingshot Aerospace, many of which are women through the executive team all the way to uh, engineers on on the slingshot team, and so, um, and the 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 path for us to succeed as women here at Slingshot Aerospace and in the ecosystem um, that we work in today has been paved by a lot of women who came before us. So it's a lot easier than when I first joined the Air Force. So. When you came to the point where you decided you're going to leave the Air Force and you wanted to start Slingshot, what was the driver towards getting into private enterprise? Yeah, certainly. So throughout my career, we were dependent upon data, whether it was looking down at the ground and lots of different um, sensors on aircraft and drones, um, just millions and millions of images that uh, analysts would have to sift through. And so, for example, whenever I was flying on JSTARS, um, we had you know, hundreds of thousands of miles of, of data that we were looking through at any given moment on the aircraft. And, you know, that, that enormous amount of data followed me over to the space side as well. So we put an enormous amount of time and energy into the widgets that we put on orbit. Um, and oftentimes data and information extraction from that data is an afterthought. Um, and so here at Slingshot, we started this company and I left the Air Force in order to drive this, but we started the company to really get after automating and extracting insights from all of that data in a new profound um, timeline. Now you raised a significant amount of funding, I think about $17 million to get Slingshot going. What do you now see as the challenge and why is it that things like artificial intelligence are so important to a company like yours? Yeah, I think, um, it, and it's not just artificial intelligence, it's really trusted artificial intelligence um, and explainable AI. And the reason that AI is so important is because, um, like I mentioned, all of that data, whether it's telemetry data or payload data 
or even um, ground data, SATCOM data, it's a lot. And so we need to take the space environment or the space industry um, into a digital transformation. A lot of other industries have already made their way through this digital transformation, but we believe it's really important to empower our uh, clients across the enterprise with more autonomy uh, with their decision frameworks. And that's what trusted AI allows us to do. So can you give me an example really of the benefits that you say that it brings to your customers or indeed society as a whole? Satellites bring capabilities that many of us take for granted, whether it's the blue dot on our phone, uh, getting from one point to another safely and, and fast, um, or whether it's uh, going to the bank or to the gas station to make a trans transaction. That Those GPS satellites don't just provide navigation, they also provide precise timing for our global um, financial systems. Um, Beyond that, we, we leverage satellites for humanitarian efforts uh, to monitor floods, to, um, to help with uh, communications. So in this disconnected world post-COVID, we're really leveraging satellites more than ever for communications. And so it's just very important that those satellites um, continue to operate in a collision-free environment um, and have the spectrum that they need to, to do their mission. Okay, so let's look at space now. We've seen recently three spacecraft going to Mars and we've got a number of lunar missions that are planned in the next few years. Almost daily there seem to be satellites going up from so many nations that have previously not been part of the space industry. It's getting really crowded up there. And you're talking about these risks. Do we need all these satellites and all those private and government activities and if so, how do we regulate that? You know, I, I do believe that we need those satellites. Uh, not all of them will be successful and, and go into an enduring state. Uh, but I think it's critical that we test um, and get, get these critical uh, capabilities um, a, a mainstay on orbit. Um, and, and, you know, right now it's regulated space safety, space traffic is regulated at the country level. And there's a lot of opportunity right now for uh, the willing um, to come in and help provide regulations that ensure that 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 um, it's an international effort versus just country by country spaces and international domain. OK, you mentioned sustainability. We were talking recently to the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency about the hundreds of thousands of pieces of space debris. How do we get that sustainability message out to the space industry? Yeah, I think it, it needs to be uh, before a, a, a catastrophe on orbit, right? That deems our orbits no longer usable for thousands of years. We have to do something now. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to get the message out. Um, I think through education um, and education starts a lot earlier than it has in the past in the space ecosystem. Um, so driving the education to an earlier age is one way that we can in the future get there. But um, in, the, in the nearest term, I think it's really important to show the benefits of maintaining a safe uh, satellite system, um, maintaining a, the ability to um, continue to operate in, in those environments and, and somehow incentivize um, you know, those mitigation strategies at the design stage versus waiting until something's on orbit. Okay, finally, Melanie, I'd like to ask you a question. I've asked this to CEOs around the world, to industry leaders as well, when we talk to them on this program. What is it that wakes you up in the middle of the night or stops you going to sleep in the first place? What's the worry point? I think there's less worry point, points and just more excitement for me. Um, we're just on the cusp of um, a, a new frontier, you know, the final frontier as it once was called, but we're, we're shaping an entirely new frontier within the, the final frontier on how to, how to harness all of this data, how to, how to educate better um, and really cultivate a workforce that, that in, in 10 or 15 years is going to be uh, taking us beyond Mars, I believe. So those types of things just get me very, very excited. Um, and, and, and the fact that we're actually helping um, our clients, whether it's military or, or private sector, make mission critical decisions better 
Um, so I'm just excited. I don't have a whole lot of worry. I know that we're going to make space more sustainable in the near term. Melanie, thank you. It's been an amazing pleasure to talk to you and I look forward to seeing you for real at the Spacecom Expo later this year. So I think you're going to have a lot to talk about there. That's going to be fascinating for the world of space. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Don't forget, if you want to get more information about Spacecom Expo or indeed any of those other issues like sustainability in space, do go to our website, wearefin.com. Thanks for watching. Thank you.